Hello and welcome to our open seminar on energy transition and Central Asia. My name is Alexander Wolters. I'm the director of the OVC Academy, and it's my pleasure to open and our pleasure to host this event. And it's in particular uh, a pleasure to host this event together with our colleagues from the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs and Europe Central Asia Monitoring Program of the Center for European Security Studies. Here on the ground with us in Bishkek and far away. Hello, Jos, I hope you can hear us very well. Dear colleagues, dear guests, dear friends, allow me a couple of words and remarks on the topic we're going to discuss today and the wider discussion here in Central Asia on climate change and its impact. Both climate change and the related question of energy transition are moving into our focus as we develop our research capacities here at the OEC Academy and begin new academic inquiries. And we said we respond and we follow uh, to the heightened attention given to climate change and its impact on security in the OECE and its programmatic debates. Let me remind you that during the last ministerial council in the beginning of December, all participating states, all 57 of them, agreed on new commitments to mitigate the risks of climate change. And this statement was reiterated in the Polish Foreign Minister Rao's speech to the Permanent Council last week. The Polish chair, following the Swedish chair in 21, underlined the need to engage into the energy transformation process to this very end. And a similar task has been set up before the OSCE's field missions here in Central Asia that seek to promote climate change risk reduction with new initiatives in the coming years. Today's launch of the new data set of our Central Asia data gathering and analysis team serves the purpose to stimulate the debate on climate change and energy transition in the region. And while this cut cut report reminds us of the many challenges ahead to decarbonize the economies in Central Asia, Dr. Overlands and Dr. Vakulchuk's paper on critical materials provides a reference uh, provides a reference to a prominent role the region might actually play in global efforts to transit to clean energy production. Finally, Dr. Overlands and Dr. Sarebekov's paper on cycling in Bishkev gives us an idea on both the challenges and the opportunities on the ground when it comes to our efforts to create better and healthier livelihoods. We see today's event as a continuation to strengthen our collaborative efforts. We plan to have more research and dialogue initiatives dedicated to climate change, impact and energy transition, and we look forward to organize them together with our partners at NUPI. This year, we will together publish an edited volume on climate change in Central Asia with contribution from the leading experts in this field. This book, which we will publish in our open access Springer series, will fill a gap in our research on Central Asia as will be explained in a forthcoming article co-authored by Indra Overland and Roman Dakulchuk. We plan to have events on both publications here at the Academy to further stimulate the debate. I want to thank Indra Overland and Roman Dakulchuk for the support and for their visit to the Academy, despite the many challenges that are currently put forward to actually traveling in the region. I extend my thanks to NUPI and the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and to the other donors of the OEC Academy. And I'm also grateful to Jos Bonstra for joining us today as a discussant for the three presentations. I'm also very thankful to Rachat Sabiobekov for his contribution to the Academy as our postdoc, as I am to Aikula Tubaetova and her team at the Research and Training Unit for taking care of preparations and the logistics. With that, I would like to, to conclude my remarks, and now I wish everybody exciting presentations and an insightful discussion. Thank you so much, and with that, I give the floor to you, Roma. Thank you very much, uh, Alexander, for uh, a very encouraging introduction to our event. Um, before we get to the content, I would like to make two uh, comments, remarks. The first one is that uh, uh, to audience here, that who, uh, all of you present here, uh, just for your information that the uh, seminar is being recorded. 
uh, and also like to our online audience. I don't know what's the number of people participating, but uh, as far as I remember, it was uh, uh, more than 100 people signed up for this event, which is also great. Uh, and the second I would like to make is that, uh, my second comment is that it's important that we all stick to the time limit that we have. And since, since I'm going first, I will try to set an example. <laughs> we'll see if I manage, but uh, uh, as Alexander said, uh, there'll be three presentations and there's a logic behind putting them in this particular order. The first presentation, which I will pre present, uh, deals with the, some of the trends in decarbonization and energy transition within Central Asia. Then Professor Inder Overland from NUPI will present a situation of uh, where Central Asia is located in the global energy transition and what role it is playing or can play in the future. And then we will have a, an excellent case study uh, to be presented by uh, Dr. Rahat Saberbeka from the uh, OEC Academy. Uh, now let's get to my presentation. I should say it's a big pleasure um, to uh, an honor also to be able to present you with our new uh, CADGAT report, uh, which, um, uh, which was published uh, yesterday. Um, and the title of this report is uh, Fossil Fuels in Central Asia, Trends and Energy Transition Risks. Uh, a few words about uh, CADGAT. Uh, CADGAT is the acronym for the Central Asia uh, Data Gathering Team. Uh, that was established back in 2009, and it's a joint initiative uh, run by the OEC Academy and uh, Norwegian Institute of International Affairs, where we have researchers based in all five countries of Central Asia uh, and working on different uh, uh, data collection tasks, which we identified uh, in advance. So far, uh, we have uh, produced um, 27 uh, data articles that present different types of uh, data sets on different topics. And as you can see, uh, our report that I'm going to present uh, comes as number 28. Uh, before that, we have a series of uh, eight, as I said, uh, this is a team of Central Asian researchers that collect data on different topics. And so, so far since 2009, uh, CADGAT produced 28 different uh, types of uh, data sets and databases and uh, the report that I'm going to present now comes as number 28. Before we had a series of data collection on 262 uh, Chinese projects in Central Asia that belong to the Belt and Road Initiative. So you can see here's the list. And this is our uh, first turn to look at the what's happening in terms of the energy transition and decarbonization in Central Asia. So this is how the uh, data article looks uh, with the co-authors. Uh, and in addition to it, we also published a unified Excel data set where uh, we have like a very detailed information and data for each of the countries, while the report provides like a summary of some of the key findings and also some of the key trends. Uh, so you can see here, it's like the structure of the report. So we have information for each country uh, according to the following um, dimension. First, we cover uh, coal production, consumption, imports, and exports. Then we also look at natural gas and also the same, as you can see, the same categories for data collection and the same with, with oil, production, consumption, imports, and exports. And the, and the whole objective behind it was that uh, during the last few years, we have been hearing a lot that Central Asia is becoming uh, quite proactive in terms of adopting renewable energy. And there are many new projects uh, that were launched recently in Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan. Uh, however, there has been very little discussion of the other side of energy transition, namely the decarbonization. So to what extent countries in the regions have been transitioning away from uh, and actually reducing uh, their use, their uh, consumption, production, and also exports of fossil fuels such as coal, natural gas, and oil. Uh, I would like to give you a couple of examples, so you can see a couple of uh, figures that show you some of the general trends, not for all the categories for all countries, but some of the selected ones, so that you get a feeling of uh, what these trends have been uh, after 2010. Of course, we, we can start uh, from uh, oil exports by Kazakhstan, and overall there has been a trend that it remained more or less stable every year, and, uh, but if you compare the numbers for 2019, we see that it actually slightly increased. Not surprisingly, probably. Uh, when it comes to oil consumption, for example, we can see that also the trends have been uh, that uh, 
countries have been actually expanding their oil consumption domestically. Uh, before 2019, uh, the year 2020 uh, should be treated with caution because we know that it was, it was the year with the pandemic uh, that has, of course, implications for uh, the fossil fuel consumption, not only in Central Asia, but also in other parts of the world. So this has been a trend for all other countries as well. But we also see that now, back in 2021, uh, the trend has been again rising uh, in terms of the oil consumption in Central Asia. The data for 2021 is not available because uh, we managed to find only it for some of the countries because this data has not been updated and uh, basically presented for all of the countries yet. Um, the same again, if we look at natural gas consumption, we see that Uzbekistan has actually reduced uh, its natural gas consumption a little bit, while other countries like Turkmenistan and Kazakhstan uh, we, and then also Kyrgyzstan have been uh, gradually expanding the uh, natural gas consumption. Uh, another very interesting item in this whole picture is, of course, uh, the old coal exports. And you, as you can see here, uh, the trends showing that, uh, well, Kazakhstan has been a leader in terms of exporting coal to some of the neighboring countries um, like uh, Uzbekistan, uh, then also uh, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some others also including China. However, if we uh, take uh, Kazakhstan away from this picture, because I mean, it's quite dominant in this picture, that's why it's difficult to make a judgment about other countries. But if we show the trends for Kyrgyzstan, we see that uh, even though it was quite limited compared to other countries in terms of the total volume, we still see that the trend was that the uh, coal exports by Kyrgyzstan have been also increasing. And I should say that, uh, Quite recently, the governments of Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan announced that they plan to expand their coal exports further. So by 2025, uh, 2025 uh, there's an expectation that both countries will keep on expanding their coal exports to some of the uh, neighboring countries. So this is also important for our understanding like what was, was happening in the past and also what are the current projections in terms of the use of fossil fuels in these countries. So what are the major threats? I, I think we should uh, basically highlight three. Uh, first of all, is that for all countries and almost for all the categories of fossil fuels, we see that uh, the consumption and also production has remained uh, either unchanged or it actually increased for some of the items. Second is that while all the countries officially recognize the need to decarbonize their energy sectors, and this is part of the many national plans, national strategies, in all five countries, this still hasn't resulted in the reduced consumption of coal, natural gas, and oil. Third, uh, electricity from renewable energy uh, has not yet displaced electricity produced from fossil fuels. And I can give you an example from Kazakhstan where we see that uh, more than 70% of, uh, percent of electricity still comes from coal, while uh, it's only 2.5% that is uh, basically generated by the use of renewable energy. So this also should give you an idea of what are the current trends in terms of the uh, decarbonizations in the region. Here, I should also mention a few things about the role of the external players, because we know they are quite important in the context of Central Asia. And here I mean particularly uh, energy importers of Central Asian fossil fuels. Uh, in our series of uh, reports on the BRI uh, that I presented before, we found that during the period of 2010-2020, more than 99% of all Chinese investments in Central Asia uh, was in fossil fuels. Here I'm talking about energy investment. And it's only less than 1% that was invested in, in clean energy. So you can see it also has an important role to play in terms of uh, providing the incentive for the region to produce more uh, fossil fuels. Uh, another interesting aspect here is that we also know that uh, quite increasingly, many of the European actors have been calling for Central Asia to decarbonize. Uh, often this comes in the form of providing capacity building for government employees or signing some you know, memorandum for exchange of information or learning from the European experience of how to decarbonize their energy sectors. At the same time, we also have the, the trend that many of the European energy companies um, like Eni, Shell, and many others also from the US that, for example, operate in Kazakhstan, they can still expand their investment in oil, oil and gas infrastructure. And of course, the expectation is that this will continue to be very much in trend in the sense of that Central Asia will continue to be a source of hydrocarbons for this, uh, for this uh, 
Western companies as well as Chinese companies. Also, I think when it comes to some other partners, they also see Central Asia as being a source of uh, hydrocarbon uh, imports. So in the end, after we collected this data and analyzed it, we came up with four uh, concrete recommendations. The first one is that we think uh, Central Asia could uh, look into the developing uh, reduction targets for fossil fuels. While Central Asia has clear, as you may know, like targets for increasing renewable energy, like Kazakhstan adopted uh, a target of 50% of renewables by 2050, and other countries like Uzbekistan also did the same. Uh, uh, we don't have, uh, like the Central Asian countries do not have clear targets for reducing the fossil fuels. Like by 2030, how much, for example, uh, coal could be reduced in the region, like in Kazakhstan or, or Kyrgyzstan and so on. So there's no discussion and there are no clear and concrete measurable targets for reducing this. Second, I think that uh, uh, also, uh, policymakers should also assess the political, economic, and social consequences of decarbonization. Especially, we think that most of the risks are embedded in the coal industry. Um, so, this is something that uh, also the government should look at in quite detail. The third, it's also important for Central Asian governments to establish a dialogue with importers. So, those countries that I mentioned, uh, in order to discuss how they could uh, promote decarbonization together and also how they could, you know, uh, uh, sort of discuss these plans of uh, developing renewable energy versus also trying at the same time to de decarbonize the energy sectors. And finally, I think it's also the responsibility of us as scholars, especially those working on Central Asia and energy, to try to pay more attention to the risks for Central Asia in terms of uh, if it fails to uh, phase out fossil fuels or if it fails to decarbonize, what would be the risks like social, economic, political and, so, political and so on. So far, we haven't seen uh, much research on this topic uh, because I think most of the scholars are very excited by this topic of renewable energy, uh, while uh, kind of very limited attention has been paid to the phasing out of uh, fossil fuels. And uh, very quickly, uh, so I think this was quite, it wasn't so positive, well, this whole overview of phasing out fossil fuels. However, I would like to, to finish uh, on a more positive note is that, uh, I think the governments in Central Asia have been quite active indeed in terms of developing renewable energy. Kazakhstan announced carbon neutrality by 2060. And I think that the, if you look at what happened in the region, the pandemic also has accelerated the transition uh, recently. Uh, but of course, the challenge is that announcing a target of uh, being carbon neutral by 2060, I think it's less challenging than announcing like the, the plan for the next five years. So how uh, the governments could reduce they are, uh, for example, use of uh, fossil fuels, right? Because it, I mean, it has to do with the embedded interests of different fossil fuel actors, and it's not so easy to do. Uh, also, we know that Kazakhstan, uh, for the first time among Central Asian countries, joined the Ernst and Young Renewable Energy Country Attractiveness Index, meaning that Kazakhstan has all the necessary conditions in place to be assessed according to the, uh, you know, this metrics of this uh, Ernst and Young. Uh, um, basically uh, ranking, which places 40 countries in terms of their attractiveness for uh, investment in renewable energy. So on this more slightly more positive note, I would like to stop and give the floor to Professor Overland. Thank you, Roman. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be back at the OC Academy, such an important institution for education and research in Central Asia and located in such a good location in Bishkek, an island of stability uh, in this region compared to some other parts of the region. <clears throat> so I'm going to try to briefly present this uh, paper, which uh, Roman who just spoke and I have co-authored and Roman is the lead author and it's been a pleasure and a privilege to cooperate with Roman on this. It's published in the journal One Earth, which is uh, published by uh, Cell Press. The starting point for this paper is that demand for many types of materials, metals and uh, industrial minerals will rise by more than 1000% in the 20, in the 2020s and 2030s 
So this is a dramatic change of markets and context for the mining industry worldwide. And if there will be 140 million EVs in 2030, which we think is a low estimate, this will mean a more than 1,000% increase in total demand by 2030 already for aluminium, cobalt, iron, lead, lithium, manganese, and nickel. And for some minerals, uh, the rise will be even higher. So for example, for germanium, uh, it's expected that demand will grow by over 8,000% by 2050. And of course, this rise in demand will be modified by uh, substitution, so new technologies emerging uh, with uh, less need for some of the minerals, um, and by recycling. So, for example, uh, most likely future uh, electric vehicle or EV batteries will not include cobalt. Um, however, uh, it is very clear that demand for minerals in general is going to rise dramatically. Historically, uh, the main critical materials in the world have been oil and gas. Um, and this has generated a lot of geopolitical interest in different parts of the world, especially in the Persian Gulf, where it has been estimated that uh, the US has spent over $8 trillion over a long period of time uh, protecting or controlling the Straits of Hormuz. So the question is, how this, at a general level, the question would be how, how will the rising interest, the shift of interest from oil and gas to critical minerals play out? And what role can Central Asia play in this? And what role will these developments play in Central Asia? And secondly, <clears throat> what role can Central Asian mineral resources play in the strategic positioning of great powers on critical materials? Those are the two questions we start, we try to answer in the paper. And our focus is specifically on critical materials for clean energy technologies. Uh, so we don't use the official lists of the EU or the US, which include a lot of um, materials which are critical for other things. So for example, the, the EU uh, lists uh, almost strangely includes coking coal, which is hardly a clean energy uh, fuel. Um, instead, we use the list of IISD, uh, which includes 25 minerals, and you will see that uh, rare earths, which are often thought of as synonymous with critical materials, are only three of these 25, and the four most critical minerals, which are used across three different technological areas, none of them are rare earths. If we look more closely at the region, um, and see the, the number of minerals which the countries uh, or the resource potential of different minerals. We see that Kazakhstan has an immense promise with 16 minerals, which it has a big potential for, a big resource base for, and another two which it has a more moderate resource base for. Uh, Uzbekistan comes second with 11 minerals that it has a very high potential for. And next is Tajikistan and next is Kyrgyzstan. Um, this makes some sense in terms of the size of the, of the countries because geography impacts the statistical probability of finding a mineral there. Uh, but it's also possible that Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan's potential also reflects the fact that these countries are less, have, have been subject to less uh, geological surveying. So in sum, Central Asia holds significant shares of world reserves of many critical materials. Uh, the most dramatic of these is manganese, where Central Asia holds 38% of world reserves. Uh, also chromium, where especially Kazakhstan has very large amounts, and also lead, zinc, titanium, aluminium, and copper. Um, all of these are extremely important for energy transition. But the most important aspect of Central Asia's resource base is not the amounts of each material, but the diversity of its mineral base. So in this relatively small part of the world, <clears throat> there are mineable uh, uh, or 
mineable amounts of most critical materials for clean energy applications. So it means that Central Asia in many years won't dominate global supply, but for a, a, a major manufacturing country uh, needing access to the full range of materials, Central Asia can be a potential one-stop shop. Um, it's, if you can access this region, <clears throat> you can access a lot of important minerals in uh, re very large or, so, or reasonable amounts. One of the things we do in the paper is we look at, we also review the literature on critical materials. And uh, we see that Central Asia is very much overlooked. So why, while for example, the, uh, this map shows the number of times that different countries are mentioned in the literature as uh, important for world supply of different critical materials. So we find that, for example, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, DRC, is mentioned 16 times, Chile 10 times, US 16 times, Canada 13 times, China 34 times, Australia 14 times, and so on. Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Turkmenistan have never been mentioned in the existing literature, and Kazakhstan has been mentioned two times. So there is a disjoint here between the resource base in Central Asia of these materials and the literature, which is talking about other countries, but not seeing the potential in Central Asia. We think that this will change and we think, we hope maybe our paper will help trigger this change. Central Asia is particularly important for China and China is the biggest player in the world on critical materials in general and especially for clean energies. China shares a 3,300 kilometer direct border with altogether three Central Asian countries. And Central Asia is particularly attractive to China because of its geographical location and this border. So other locations, for example, Congo or Chile are located very far away. Um, and in the case of Congo, uh, in an unstable region, and any materials brought in have to be transported over the oceans, uh, where the other countries play a big role in maritime security. Central Asia, with its direct border, is, uh, is a much less complex um, location for China to get its materials from. China is already the largest investor and importer of, crucial, of critical materials from Central Asia plays a big role in the mining sector in these countries. Uh, in Kyrgyzstan, there are already nine Chinese companies active in mining, and in Tajikistan, eight companies. And they also own the majority of licenses for mining critical materials in these countries. And in Kazakhstan, they, are, they're a bit, uh, they don't own so many licenses, but China is the main destination for most of Kazakhstan's critical materials uh, mining output. If you look at copper, uh, which is very important uh, for energy transition because energy transition means electrification across the board, electric electrification of transport, of electric vehicles, big and small, um, of rail transport, of scooters and small vehicles, um, and of all kinds of appliances. And copper is used for all of these purposes, both for wiring to transport it and in electrical motors. So copper is very important at current rates, or China is one of the world's biggest producers, but at current rates, the uh, R to P ratio, that's the reserves to production ratio, gives China 16 years of production before they're empty of copper. Um, and uh, the, one of the biggest suppliers of China is the Demo Dem Democratic Republic of Congo, and they have 14 years left at current uh, reserves to production ratio. So unsurprisingly, there is rising interest in Chi Chinese interest in Kazakh copper. Uh, and Kazakh is a very large producer of copper with large reserves and a very well-developed uh, or very extensive infrastructure. Um, on, this, on these figures, we see copper here at the bottom. Um, from 2017 to 20, copper, rose, uh, copper exports from Kazakhstan to China rose by 23%. Um, molybdenum, 
molybdenum was even more dramatic with 444% rise, uh, zinc 103% rise, and lead 94% rise in just three years. And we can expect more of these trends to these trends to continue in the coming years. There are, <clears throat> of course, many opportunities associated with these developments and trends for Central Asia and for other countries involved in mining in Central Asia, but there are also risks and challenges. One is that uh, Central Asia has aging mining infrastructure and some of it is very dilapidated. There's limited transparency, weak governance and corruption, uh, which creates all kinds of risks, both for Central Asia and for the, those who are investing in the region. Um, there is a risk that if critical materials come to replace oil and gas as the major exports from the region, that this may lead to continued uh, hindrance for economic diversification. So from relying on one type of raw material and shifts to relying on another one. And uh, mining by activities by foreign companies have been sources of conflict in Central Asia. And we expect to see more of that if the governance uh, doesn't and corruption don't improve. There's also a risk of uh, very one-sided dependent on China, kind of monopsony situation, uh, and the possibility that China could, in, could, could pursue um, minerals for loans types of deals with, for example, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which they have already done with other countries in the world, such as in DRC. The paper where all this is taken from contains a lot more information and a lot of uh, fresh data, which we've collated from very many different sources, including the governments of Central Asia, and is open access uh, and available on the uh, address given here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Indra, for a very interesting presentation. Indeed, it was a great pleasure and to work on this uh, article together. And uh, we actually spent more than one hour uh, collecting uh, data from different sources. So it was very uh, time consuming process. Um, next, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome and give the floor to our third uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Rahat Saberbeke from the OEC Academy. Mm, thank you. Uh, Thank you very much, Roman, for the introduction. So I would like to present today a paper written uh, together with uh, Professor Indra Overland. So the title, as you can see from the slide, Why Choose to Cycle in a Low-Income Country? So as uh, Roman underlined in the very beginning, so the process of decarbonization in many industries, industries across the Central Asian countries will also uh, have impact on the transport sector, which is and cycling is seen by many policymakers as a, one of the key decarbonization uh, policies in the uh, in the area. So uh, from the uh, and there are many reasons why cycling has become a kind of policy goal in many countries, and the reasons are quite obvious. So first of all, it's uh, there is a lots of evidence that's improvement in public health, reduced public expenditure in terms of uh, decreasing infrastructure, gains in uh, health benefits, uh, physical mobility, local mobility. Also, it improves the air quality uh, locally. And of course, it's also uh, land use gains in terms of uh, more efficient use of urban space and also reduced greenhouse emissions. Uh, so literature uh, is clear on the cycling literature, it's, there are many benefits and uh, many studies have been done in uh, high income countries and they say that the factors which uh, help uh, or kind of drive the cycling up, uh, uptake, its attitudes toward the cycling, uh, climate conditions, uh, obviously the fav more favorable climate leads to more uh, cyclists on the road, social norms and identities. Uh, in some countries, there are uh, very favorable social norms in terms of cycling, and other countries' social norms actually make a barrier to uh, <clears throat> to take up the cycling. And uh, there are other reasons include social demographic characteristics such as income, for example, uh, gender, uh, comfort, and safety are one of the key areas. Uh, obviously, uh, more safe it is to cycle, the more people will be cycling. Uh, environmental awareness or uh, care about the nature has been becoming a, one of the dominant reasons in uh, 
in recent years concerns about air quality and uh, integration with public transport, especially in, the, in those countries and cities where the public transport is well developed and the integration with cycling has been an important feature. And the uh, gender and purpose of cycling as well. Uh, so, uh, but uh, the, there is a, what we, when we did the res literature research, and uh, we've seen that there are many, despite that there is a, a many uh, research studies has been published about the cycling adoption. Uh, it's mostly comes from high income countries. Scientific literature on cycling in developing countries remains very scarce, and the India is uh, probably the only exception. There are many studies, but in other countries, basically, uh, very few papers have been published. Uh, so, uh, despite that, uh, there is a, a growing concern about air pollution in global north in developing countries, and there is a uh, lots of talk about uh, decarbonization of transport industry. The basically, uh, not much research has been done in uh, in developing countries where the air pollution and decarbonization of transport is uh, high due to air pollution and due to constrained uh, financial resources. So the research question of this study was to identify factors that lead to the adoption of bicycle as a mode of transport in a low, economy, a low income economy context, where the cars are typically motorized transport has been a, prior, has been a priority and state basically uh, doesn't allow, uh, build any uh, or, you know, infrastructure, cycling infrastructure to, uh, to create incentive. And uh, we found no paper also who, who has uh, addressed this issue in the uh, former Soviet Union space. And it, so it's, uh, for us, it was very interesting to see what are the factors actually and the state actually. So, uh, I mean, uh, there are more detailed uh, information on the method section, but basically uh, the uh, conventional approach has been used, a theory of planned behavior. Uh, has been used by Aztec and basically says uh, looks uh, into the risks uh, and factor analysis to uh, identify which factors are dominant and this resulted factors from the factor loadings were used for the logistic regression model. Uh, so we surveyed uh, 900 cyclists and ended up with uh, cyclists and non-cyclists and ended up with uh, 840 as you can see because of, uh, 60 were not complete uh, complete uh, questionnaires. So prior to survey, we conducted focus groups uh, uh, to, to check our questionnaire. And also we had a couple of interviews with the cycling NGOs to make sure that uh, we are uh, capturing the relevant factors. So uh, briefly, the results are that, uh, uh, so roughly 50, Two were cyclists included in the sur uh, survey, and only 24% uh, used them as a means of transport, while the almost 70% used only for leisure. And the reasons uh, for cycling among uh, cyclists was that it was good for health, as you can see. Uh, the public transportation is poor, that's why I cycle. It saves money and uh, many of my friends cycle, many of uh, my family cycles and I don't have a car, but also three remaining kind of most popular reasons. Uh, and uh, the major obstacles, as you can see from table six here, uh, among non-cyclists uh, was that uh, marshutkas, because uh, uh, marshutkas are dangerous basically, that's why I don't cycle. And private cars are also dangerous, the way they are driving, that's why I don't try, uh, cycle. And absence of uh, cycling infrastructure was uh, also important. Uh, and then uh, obstacles among cyclists was that uh, the major threat or danger again was uh, from marshutkas and uh, private cars. And again, infrastructure was also. Uh, So uh, when we uh, performed the factor analysis of so the three factors uh, dominated our data. So first was cycling is environmentally friendly. Uh, second is public transport is safe and driving a car is comfortable. So then this, uh, as I said, uh, these factors were used for the uh, logistic regression and to see what, uh, what is the likelihood or what is the probability of the affecting 
the cycling uptake. So, and the, uh, the uh, kind of the findings of variables, uh, significant variables was that number of, okay, let me rephrase the question. So typical person who would cycle in Bishkek would be a person who lived many years in Bishkek uh, is thinking that, or she's thinking that cycling is environmentally friendly and exercises regularly, uh, excluding cycling itself. So it's uh, fit person, I suppose. Uh, the negative uh, coefficients were the age, the older the person gets, uh, the less likely he or she is to cycle. Uh, leaves in a block of flats, it's probably due to lack of storage. Civil servant, student, and car ownership, and female. Uh, and then, uh, so the conclusion and policy recommendations uh, would be that cycling in Bishkek still is mainly about leisure with small share of cyclists using the transport mode. And due to number of reasons as, uh, as we have showed previously, and uh, in contrast to high income countries, students in uh, Bishkek probably uh, are less likely to cycle. This is probably true for all uh, probably all post-Soviet Union countries. Uh, it's probably, at least in my, uh, uh, I would guess that this is, uh, again, social norm. And then poor quality transport both stimulates cycling uh, because, it, uh, because lack of public transport uh, makes kind of forces people to take up cycling. At the same time, it creates a major challenge for cycling adoption. Yeah, again, this uh, poor public transport, uh, specifically in form of uh, marshrutkas, actually has been uh, stated as a major kind of danger, uh, challenge barrier. And uh, following up, I guess, to reference to uh, Roman, which mentioned that also that there are so much attention about current uh, electric cars, but not much actually the cheap and uh, affordable options such as walking and cycling and development of public transport. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Rohat, for the excellent presentation. I should say that I was happy to see your article published because I think it was one of the first in this whole area to looking at this very important uh, problem. Um, it's now my great pleasure to turn to our uh, good colleague, Jos uh, uh, Bonstra, who lives in Groningen, Netherlands. So the country with one of the most developed cycling cultures uh, in the world. Jos uh, Bonstra uh, will be our discussant. Uh, and Jos is a coordinator of the U Europe Central Asia Monitoring, uh, EUCAM, and also a uh, center uh, for European security studies. Uh, Jos, I hope you can hear us. Uh, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot, Roman. Uh, very good seeing you all. Greetings from Groningen, the Netherlands. Very happy to be part uh, of this seminar together with colleagues from NUPI and the OEC Academy. Good seeing you, Alexander, Indra, Roman, and Rahat. First of all, compliments to the researchers. I really see three very important contributions that will surely lead to more research and hopefully also to more policy awareness. So it's a privilege to, uh, to offer some first uh, comments and uh, to be able uh, to ask some questions first. So to start off with uh, the gut uh, energy transition in Central Asia trends and risks uh, data that was presented by Roman. So in this gut cut issue on fossil energy, I'm really impressed uh, by the presentation of data that is accompanied by a very brief to the point analysis and clear policy recommendations. And this you don't often see, either it's a lot of data or it's long papers with uh, uh, narrative and recommendations. Here the combination is great and it's really easy to absorb for a broader public. One issue, uh, however, uh, hovering over this contribution uh, and the next article also, which is on critical uh, material, is the position of natural gas, I think. So last week, the European Union stated to consider investing in gas, uh, a green uh, issue. Well, it's of course also a fossil energy. And this sort of confusion 
next to all the geopolitics surrounding gas, makes it, of course, very difficult for a country like Turkmenistan that is so dependent to think about uh, redu reducing their output of natural gas. I also have a question on this uh, paper. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's an important tool for research, uh, GATGAT, and I'm just very curious to know that while there are so many new journalistic and civil society initiatives springing up in Central Asia or on Central Asia, I was wondering if you could maybe hint already a little bit what we can expect from GATGAT in the future. Uh, because a lot of important data has already been provided, but there are, of course, lots of issues to, uh, to further think about. Second, the, the article on critical materials in Central Asia and the global energy transition. Again, my compliments on this article, an extremely complex issue is explained and debated in clear and understandable language. The data and tables are pertinent to understanding the article and valuable for future research. I especially like uh, the, the risk factors that are presented on infrastructure and governance, and they are clearly all interlinked, but they are also worth separate research projects. The crisis, or the very recent crisis in Kazakhstan, showed how grievances in the population are clearly linked to regime security and in turn linked to regional and international security. Uh, one of the things I noticed in this crisis that uh, in one newspaper, it was immediately mentioned that uranium, which might not be a critical material for the global energy transition, but that Kazakhstan produces 40% of global demand. And it was no surprise that immediately the price for uranium went, uh, I think, 8% up as soon as the crisis started. So this shows uh, also, uh, with this paper, how clearly linked stability and global demand for minerals are and what role Central Asia plays in this. Also here, a question to start off with. Uh, you mentioned that the EU does not uh, take up critical material and minerals in its EU strategy of 2019. Now, there's also an EU-Asia connectivity uh, strategy that basically uh, was meant as a sort of answer to the Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, also there, there is no mention whatsoever of, uh, of critical energy, of critical materials. And that makes me wonder that 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of attention to fossil energy, and there still is. But what have we learned from this episode? Uh, how did we deal with this as researchers? How did we have impact or didn't have impact uh, on policy making? So what lessons are there learned in discussing the current issue of critical materials looking back, back at fossil energies that are still so important? So the third article I enjoyed a lot uh, on cycling. Uh, of course, it's also close to my heart. It's an excellent article with some very interesting findings. I found it uh, interesting, but also uh, sad to read that uh, in high income countries, public transport is seen as a competitor of cycling, while in Kyrgyzstan, it's seen as a threat to cyclists. So th there are some very interesting findings, and it would really be good to also measure these findings indeed to other post-Soviet countries. Uh, as there might indeed be, as Rahat uh, mentioned, uh, a lot of uh, things the same. Uh, you might know that in the Netherlands, uh, there's a lot of cycling going on. Uh, in many cities over the last 50 years, uh, using a car in the center of the city was almost made impossible. Um, and this strengthened an already existing culture of cycling. But sometimes the cycling can also be a bit too much, and for that I wanted to show you a few pictures. Um, hope you can see them. To give you an impression that in the city where I live, I took a few pictures. This is in Groningen, the Netherlands. Uh, that sometimes cycling can be a bit too much and that we have grave problems uh, parking our bicycles. This is a parking garage. Here you see another parking garage next to it. 
This is a bicycle highway underneath the station. And this is the main square uh, where people are forced to put their bicycles in lines, elsewise it will be a big mess. This is just to show you that uh, cycling is not a panacea in this sense. Although it would be good if there is more cycling in Bishkek. Uh, and this also leads me to a question. Um, I, I was struck by reading that it's especially uh, students that are very skeptical about cycling uh, in Bishkek. And I must admit that uh, in the EUCA program, we uh, host fellows on a regular basis. And often these are uh, people that were recently students in Bishkek. They have the possibility to use a bicycle at our office in the Netherlands, but they seldomly do so. Now, Rahat, you mentioned uh, that social norms might be uh, a blocking uh, factor in using bicycles and that it's mostly seen as sports. But can you tell us a little bit more about these social factors and why they uh, might be uh, a blockage for uh, using the bike? Um, and that brings me already to a conclusion. I want to be short, uh, so to make sure that uh, everyone has an opportunity to ask questions and to join the debate. But then looking at these uh, three uh, excellent contributions taken together, there are sort of two main threads I see throughout the work. The first one is the link between, on the one hand, climate change, environment, and energy transition, and on the other hand, security concerns. Think of critical material and recent instability in Kazakhstan. Uh, maybe far-fetched, but also the contribution on biking in Bishkek has clear human security aspects connected to it, as a lot of people fear uh, uh, car, cars and are afraid to step on their bicycles. So how do authors and participants see this? How do they see this uh, link between security on the one hand and uh, environment, climate change and energy transition on the other? Uh, the second uh, uh, clear line that I see in all papers, uh, the need for greater uh, attention to energy transition and environment research and outreach on Central Asia. So, we also need to make a sort of transition, not only in energy, but also in our research and how we bring it to the attention of policy makers. So these are long-term issues that we have to bring to the attention of short-term thinking politicians. How to do this better? Um, and I'm very curious to also hear have ideas uh, from the authors and the participants. But thank, again, thanks a lot. Uh, Excellent uh, to join this, and I'm very uh, keen to uh, to join further in the discussions. Uh, thank you so much, Jos, for the um, excellent uh, summary and also your insights, and also sharing uh, the some of the pictures from from Groningen. Um, I think it's also must be quite inspiring for us. I, I suggest that maybe we uh, follow up on some of the questions that Jos asked. Uh, also to Rahat and to Indra, maybe Indra, you could be first. Thank you, Roman. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Jos, you mentioned the EU-Asia strategy and how it uh, does talk about oil and gas, I think. Um, the, the sound wasn't so good here, but this is what I quote. But it, so it does talk about oil and gas and fossil fuels, but it doesn't uh, pay any attention to critical materials and this side of thing, where obviously Asia is important, uh, both China, uh, Japan as a, as a very important importing country, uh, Malaysia as a producer, and obviously Central Asia as a, as a resource region. What, what, what have we learned or what can we learn? <clears throat> and what I see is that, um, that there is inertia. So it takes time before institutions uh, see the importance of changes. Um, and they tend to be very conservative in their, in their agendas. Um, and we see this uh, also, uh, maybe strangely, maybe even more in academia. So we, in about two months from now, we, will, we anticipate to publish a paper in Central Asia Survey, um, where we review all of the literature uh, since 1990 and all conferences and each individual conference panel and all organizations working on 
uh, doing research on Central Asia, so all Central Asian studies. It, this is a big, a big paper, and we show that uh, uh, climate and climate-related issues have received close to zero attention, almost nothing, while a lot of other topics uh, have received a lot of attention. Although climate change is very important for Central Asia, and Central Asia is one of the regions in the world which is most sensitive to it uh, because of its latitude and because of the sensitivity of, of water availability to agriculture and, and uh, also due to the capacity of the governments in the region to handle uh, challenges that come up. Um, so we hope with that paper to, 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 to kind of shift uh, research out of this inertia and maybe also, <laughs> maybe also the EU and other organizations and countries will follow. <clears throat> Right, I think I'll leave. There are some questions in the in the chat, but I'll I'll leave it at that for now, and we we'll return to the chat afterwards. Yeah, we'll get back to it. Uh, and the question was to Rohat about the uh, perception of young population, mm -hmm. right? That it's mm -hmm. quite negative attitude towards mm -hmm. cycling culture. Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Thank you very much for your comments. Uh, yes, indeed. Unfortunately, at the moment, young people. Uh, I mean, there are many surveys have been done, and. Uh, what you want to buy when you will have money, enough money, the first kind of salary, the typical answer, maybe 99% of the young persons, at least in Bishkek, they say that they will buy a car. Uh, and I see students here, maybe, uh, <laughs> I guess they can confirm on the be few. And social norm is very strong here in terms of cycling, as you see in one of the tables that uh, one of the barriers for non-cyclists says, what other people will say, uh, kind of very strong uh, societal kind of pressure, you know, if, if a grown-up man is cycling here in Bishkek, uh, local, he, I think he'll be perceived uh, very different than, uh, than in somewhere in Netherlands, I guess. So this is quite strong, but I believe on a positive note, it's changing, it's changing fast. So I think in coming years, it will, the social norms will be opposite, but it still uh, t takes time, I suppose. So, and this is uh, one upcoming event out of many that we are planning to hold for the future. We hope to have this new article out before the summer and to have an event here at the OEC Academy before the summer. Um, and another thing which I don't think you've mentioned is that uh, the three of us, uh, Rahat, Roman and I, are working on a book in the series um, of the OEC Academy published by Springer, Open Access. And this, the one we're working on now that the three of us are editing, it will be a, an edited volume on uh, climate, uh, climate, climate policy and uh, clean energy issues in Central Asia with contributors from around the region and from the rest of the world. And that, will, that book will also be published and extensively presented uh, here at the OC Academy a little bit later this year. Thank you. Uh, and on this note, uh, I would like to thank everyone here uh, in the audience, as well as all, all our online participants, which I think 67 of them stayed with us until the end. So it's a great pleasure. Uh, thank you once again. Uh, we hope to be in touch soon regarding the new event. Uh, and now I think it's the time also for coffee break, right? Thank you.